Welcome to another law video and before we go any further I just want to say a word or two about two people that we've sadly lost since my last video. Firstly Joe Plater, a very popular streamer, contributor, massive fan of Elite who sadly lost his battle with cancer after several years. He never let it get him down and he was laughing and joking to the end and uh, I've often felt that's how I'd like to be if it ever happened to me and and whether I would have the same courage as he did. He's, uh, he is and always will be a hero and an example to us all. Rest in peace, Joe, wherever you are. Secondly, Michael Brooks. And what can we say about Michael Brooks? It would probably be easier to say what we can't say about Michael Brooks. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have most of the lore for me and the others to do videos about. He was heavily involved in the stories early in the game's development. Many of the stories, too numerous to mention, have their roots in the ideas box that was Michael. He was also responsible for bringing in third-party writers like Drew Wagar. He was their FDev liaison, allowing them to enrich the lore still further. So there are two new massive black holes left in the community by the passing of these two giants and uh, imagine a drink in my hand right now making a toast to the storytellers to the people who make us laugh cry scream and go through the whole entire gamut of emotions as they fire our imaginations and keep us sane in an insane world thanks for everything you give us also, there's been a change at the top at AXI. M. Graham has stepped down as AXI Overseer. He's moving on to new games and new things in his life, and we wish him all the best in whatever he does from now on. Back when we threw it open for people to design a logo for our squad, he was one of the people who sent us a design, and like AXI in general, he's always been supportive and encouraging our efforts. And congratulations to Aaron as a new Overseer. Uh, wish you all the best in your new role. So, in the spirit of the stories that uh, they would still wish us to carry on telling, let's see where the story is taking us at the moment. The strange situation in Witchhead, with an attack that dragged on for weeks with no progress, has now been resolved. Some of Ida, amongst others, went down there and cleared out Shenv. The attacks have stopped, and Chloe Sadisi is back in Cinder Dock. I do wonder what the point was. Perhaps FDev had some side story going on, but with everybody too busy in the bubble to get involved, it almost seems like they thought, OK, well, maybe this is too soon, and quietly put her back without any fanfare as if none of it happened, despite the Galnet article making a big deal at the time about her having to evacuate with a panicky last message. However, not everything is back to how it was. And although Shenv is clear now, other systems down there like Haki, Evangelist, Lembas, stations we've visited many times before to do rescues in the past. Those stations are abandoned but the systems still show as populated. So perhaps there is more mileage in the Witchhead situation for the story yet, with the recovery of lost systems becoming part of some future narrative. The expected community goal for getting samples from the Titan ships in the Maelstroms happened and they decided to pitch it as a contest between Azimuth and Aegis to see who got the most samples. Aegis won and we'll find out the consequences of that in due course. I'm still expecting another community goal asking for more samples before update 16 in August. I could be wrong but it seems to me that you don't create a massive new asset and put it in and then only do something with it for one week. So if it isn't for more sampling, then it's something else to do with the Titans between now and the expected August release date of Update 16. Of course, what people want is for a way into the Titans and maybe even running through the massive ships and fighting with the long-awaited Thargoids on foot. And that could be what is being set up right now. Perhaps at first we'll find some way to weaken the Titans, which in turn may weaken the systems they've controlled and make them easier to take back, or evict the Thargoids from them, 
if they were previously uninhabited. And then, having weakened the Titans at the end of the year, we find a way to break into them and finally get to fight the Thargoids on foot. This is obviously speculation, but it would be very cool and a uh, perfectly logical extension of everything that Odyssey is about, you know, being on foot. But yeah, a running battle through Titan Megaship is uh, something that I'm sure a lot of players would not say no to if they decide to go that way. Whatever happens, I'm sure there's going to be more Titan-related community goals to come. But this week, we've got a mining community goal. That's a bit of an obscure one, this, with no real indication as to its importance to the story as a whole. It could just be a bit of a gap filler until update 16. But the federal corporation Coca-Cola Limited are running a mining community goal where they're paying over the odds for Bertrandite, Praesidonium and Coltan. And players have already noted that you could get more from mining platinum near a resource site with a mining map. But this isn't too bad because mining maps aren't for everyone. Contributing to a community goal is usually motivation enough for people not to worry about whether they're min-maxing or not. And the payout isn't that bad. And there's also a metal-rich ring with the materials wanted in the system itself, practically outside the door. So while it might not be optimal, it's a decent little learner in its own right and very, very easy for anybody to participate in. I love the bit where the company is basically saying, hey, if we make more money, we pay more taxes so we contribute to the war effort more. Aren't we good people? It's a novel way to excuse corporate greed, and I bet whoever wrote that had a bit of fun. That's some top quality through the looking glass spin there. After the feds arrested the Far God and impounded their megaship, the Dedicant, President Mahon of the Alliance made the feds an offer. Why not deport them all to Alliance space where they're not outlawed and get them out of the Fed's hair for good? And some people think that Mahon's being a bit of a grandstanding here, positioning himself as a tolerant but firm leader without the full-on heavy-handed authoritarianism of the Federation. But whatever the case, the Fed's agreed. There's been no word about the First Apostle, the apparently charismatic and persuasive leader of the True Chapter, but the True Chapter were to be shipped out first, from Papontia, in the Dedicant, with a federal escort, and in return the cult would give the Feds access to all the databases on the ship, and all of their holy texts. The Dedicant would go on to pick up other Far God cultists from Federation systems, and take them all to Alliance space. That was the plan. But then it all went pear-shaped. The true chapter jumped the dedicant ahead of schedule and vanished. We don't know where it went. We don't know how many of the federal officers in the escort were on board. And despite the feds and the alliance searching for them, the dedicant is gone. The feds, being the feds, think the chapter overpowered the escort. But the alliance doubts this because they say that the far god are fatalistic, not combative so possibly they got help from a third party. Whatever the case, the ship is still missing, and that was that, until Shojin A had a visit from the non-true chapter members of the Far God cult, who demanded an audience with her. Thinking they might have information on a dedicant she could give to the Feds and Alliance, she agreed to meet them, but it was obvious within a few minutes that they knew nothing of any true chapter plan to hijack the ship, or where it was now, so the lead the Feds and the Alliance were hoping she'd get for them came to nothing, in her own words. The meeting wasn't as productive as the FIA hoped. I asked the cultists for information, but they wouldn't stop jabbering about their religion. They wanted me to share divine commandments from the Titans and kept asking when the Far God would arrive to cleanse the galaxy. I'll always be grateful to these people for rescuing me a few months ago, but it's hard work convincing them I'm not a prophet. During the brief period I got talking about the Dedicant, they admitted knowing nothing about a true chapter scheme to retake the megaship, and they certainly have no clue where it is now. The meeting was mostly a waste of time. One thing was possibly useful though. Apparently, the interiors of Far God megaships are remodelled to make them deliberately confusing for heretics. Corridors like insect tunnels, rooms turned into hive cells, that sort of thing. 
When I told him the FIA had already examined the ship's layout while it was in custody, one cultist argued that they hadn't found the secret doors. They explained how Theta-7 failed to get the hyperdrive working after he gained control of the sacrosanct, and claimed that the crew of that ship rigged the thing with traps. Maybe that's how the FIA agents lost control of the Dedican. So that's interesting. Going back to Theta-7 and the NMLA when he tried to escape in a Far God megaship, so they booby-trapped it. And in this case, perhaps the uh, cult managed to use these secret doors and passages to escape the escort, lock them out of the controls and jump the ship. Perhaps they were even able to contain the feds without harming them, which the feds will hate if that's true, because they're determined to think of the Far God as militant terrorists, despite there being zero evidence of their committing any act of violence at all, ever. The mother of Arissa is ill and receiving treatment, and we'll see what comes of that, but the article speculates that perhaps Adrian might behave himself a bit more and remember whose side he's on the next time he calls her out in public. And perhaps that's all this is, a bit of healing in the internal rifts of the Empire, and to me, as I've got no stake in any of the superpowers, it's all, well, not necessarily much ado about nothing because it could always lead to something but much of a muchness I'm more interested at the moment in their contribution to the war or lack of it than any of their internal squabbles at this point in time they keep teasing it's a challenge to Arissa and then nothing comes of it so it's just another day of entitled royals shouting at each other in a prehistoric system of government with all the vision, talent, imagination and forward-looking attitude that you can expect of people stuck 4,000 years in the past. An antique, gaudy monument to inherited wealth, stagnation and quite appalling taste in architecture. Not unlike a lot of other empires, really. On to the war, and we are slowly turning the tide. After 31 long weeks since November... From frantically defending what we can, we've become more organised, more knowledgeable and more experienced in how the war machine works, and the results are finally beginning to show. If you've been watching this series, you'll know that I've been saying for a while that although we have moved on from largely preventing invasions by taking out the alerts, any invasions that slip through now are normally dealt with in a couple of days, but nothing will change in a major way until we can also stop systems being re-alerted by taking out the controlled systems that attack them. And as that's the job of AX, it's not really our remit as a rescue squad. Although if FDEV create non-combative activities to do, we're all for it. And in the meantime, our allies are AX and they're getting to as many controls as they can. Through the research done by Ian Doncaster, which has been refined each week by experience and observation, we now know with an almost perfect degree of accuracy which controlled systems are causing which other systems to become alerted. As you can see from this screenshot from last week, seven alerts were predicted for Tyrannus this week, but each maelstrom can only produce a maximum of five, and all five of this week's alerts are on this list. We also have a list for this week of the control systems that will most likely cause alerts next week and every Thursday the list is updated throughout the day so by Thursday evening we know which controls will cause which alerts the following week if they're not taken out first. Taking out all of them in a week is not an option yet but the AX pilots and tissue samplers are taking out some of them and that process will continue but many of them will be tough to clear so it's slow and steady at the moment. However, the process will no doubt accelerate as more pilots get involved. For a control system to cause an alert, it has to be within 10 light years. And if for any reason it doesn't cause an alert that week, it can't cause one for another few weeks, as if it has one chance that week, and if it doesn't use it, that's it. Opportunity lost for a while, and then next week, it's another control's turn to have a go. But then, as more and more control systems get cleared, it never gets that chance because the knock-on effect of clearing those controlled systems is that the Maelstrom loses its ability to cause the full number of alerts in a week. Each Maelstrom normally produces 5 alerts a week, giving us 40 new alerts to deal with every Thursday. But with the ability to cause alerts reduced by taking out control systems, 
and clearing the ones that can affect human space, we've seen the Maelstrom's ability to produce new alerts drop from 40 to 39 for two weeks, and then last week to 34, and this week only 24 new alerts were generated. It's a bit like spinning plates, and it's quite awkward to explain, but it, but it works. At the start of the war, the Thargoids were taking over huge amounts of territory. 50 systems a week for a few months until they had over 1,100 systems. With all of the invasions and alerts to clear, it was obvious we were not supposed to be able to stop that. In the last two weeks, the Thargoids have lost a couple of hundred systems and they're no longer expanding into new ones. This week, they're down to 970 systems under their control and hopefully, as the weeks go by, that will keep dropping and dropping and dropping. Thanks to the work of the AX pilots and tissue samplers in controlled systems, we've retaken many of them, kicked them out of a lot of uninhabited ones, stopped the maelstroms from taking any new systems, and by hitting the counter-strike systems as well as the controls that cause new alerts to appear, we appear to be hindering the expansion and forcing them to a standstill while we retake some of that territory. The turning point we've all been waiting for has finally arrived. As each week goes by, we're reducing the Maelstrom's ability to create new alerts, which in turn prevents those systems going on to be invaded, and meanwhile, more and more controlled systems are being retaken from the Thargoids, or they're being kicked out so the system returns to being uninhabited. At PDES, we have split our strategy, and we're using tissue sampling to clear unpopulated alerts, so they don't become new controlled systems, and the populated ones that are harder or more time consuming to do rescues from, like only having a single outpost or ports that take several minutes to fly to before you can even pick up passengers. We're doing those with tissue sampling and leaving the rescues to be done in the systems where they work best, big stations near the star and so on. So now we just have to keep the pressure on. Knock out the alerts as they appear, Clear as many controlled systems around them as possible, reduce the Maelstrom's ability to invade and expand, and push inwards towards the Maelstrom's, taking back territory as we go. We've been moaned at a bit because people like invasions and our aim is to ultimately stop them, and believe me, the irony is not lost on us. Our whole squad was created to work in invasion systems, but it's an irony that we've always understood that our ultimate goal does mean eventually working ourselves out of a job. But then, this is where I would want extra and different kinds of rescue operations to be expanded on and created. I've wanted that for a long time. New types of rescue should be created for those who enjoy that kind of gameplay and roleplay. There doesn't have to be a war on for that to happen. Some people only got involved with this war when the Maelstroms arrived, but for the player base as a whole, we've been waiting five and a half years now to do something once and for all about these invasions, ever since the very first attack station on December the 15th, 3303. We're not necessarily looking for a complete resolution, but for the narrative to move on from the attack, repel, attack, repel, attack, repel loop that the war's been stuck in since it began. And now, finally, we have the chance for some sort of progression to happen. We don't want to be stuck in this stage of the war any more than we want it to be stuck in a loop of hit and run attacks. We want it to actually go somewhere. Personally, I think six to seven months is about right to turn this thing around. The first few months learning and organizing, the next few focusing and optimizing our operations, and now finally getting to the point where we can where we can take control systems and slowly push back eventually the control systems around the current human areas will be cleared out so those areas will no longer be alerted or invaded and presumably then with the maelstroms unable to cause any new alerts or move into any new territory we'll be left with a ton of control systems to gradually clear as we push inwards towards each maelstrom so for those worried that invasions will disappear completely, I would remind them that as we do push inwards towards the Maelstroms, we will no doubt retake more previously inhabited systems, and they will need protecting while the AX pilots push on. 
And as those systems come out of recovery, they could become candidates for re-alerting and re-invasions with new control systems once more within 10 light years, ready to become the next wave of attackers. But any retaken systems closer to the Maelstrom will theoretically become the new alerts and invasions, the next wave of alerts and invasions. And as they're closer to the Maelstrom, they will be in order of magnitude harder to clear and protect than the ones we have now. In that sense, we can even look at all the work done so far, and it has been an immense amount of hard work. We can look at that now as training for an even harder task ahead. There's also a significant proportion of the player base who believe that the next update will give us a new set of punishing challenges, with some people believing that, just as we're on the point of dealing with a situation so far, they're going to hit us with something else it will take time to cope with. But at the back of my mind, I've still got this nagging feeling that why did the Thargoids take over all of this territory? They've not done anything with it. They've not sewn any barnacles, they've not built anything, they've just occupied these systems. What for? Are they actually going to do anything with these systems? Or is this just to keep us occupied while they find whatever they're looking for if that's what they're doing or achieve whatever other objectives they may have well, let's see what we can get done before the next update in august and i will try to find some time to get a titan build together so i can go and have a look at that in the meantime stay safe keep up the good fight and as always thanks for watching